Hallelujah. Amen. Let's pray. And what we're going to do is we're going to read Matthew chapter 22 this morning. This is a parable. Okay. And I'm going to, I'm going to do some teaching this morning. I love to teach. I'm going to believe God, Holy Spirit, have your way. Lord, I yield my vessel to you, my mouth to you, my heart to you. I pray that you would speak your truth and that you would allow your truth as I minister to your people in Jesus' name. So let's read this parable. So it's a parable about a wedding feast, a king that has a son, and he's inviting everybody to come to the wedding feast. Okay, now let me just tell you this. The book of Revelation speaks of the fact that there is going to be a marriage supper of the Lamb. What does that mean? When it's all said and done, the Bible teaches that those that served God, those that gave their lives to God, are going to engage in the heavenly realm in a banqueted feast yes. that's going to celebrate what the Lord has done for you. Amen. Praise God. So here we go. And Jesus answered and spoke unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son. And sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready, coming to the marriage. But they made light of it. And they went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth or angry. And he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then saith he to his servants, the wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways and as many as you shall find bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many are called, but few are chosen. Hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus, for your goodness and your grace and your mercy. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. So look. I just want to kind of get started a little bit first, and I want to kind of introduce a concept to you. So this is a parable. That's, there's many parables within the Word of God. There's even in, in Old Testament language, there's, uh, I'm not trying to use a bunch of fancy words, but I like words, parabolic. The idea is that, that it's parable in nature. And I'm going to try to explain to you a little bit about what a parable is so that you can understand the purpose of a parable. So this is the word in the Greek language right here, parabolo. I don't expect you to remember it, but I'm just making a point. In the Greek Words are compound words oftentimes. You see there, so this is a two pound. You remember how we learned about compound words? Two words that are brought together and they have meaning. Each word by itself has meaning. Side, para means side, below means to throw. That's where we get the word ball. But, it, but the, literally the word means to throw. So what literally it's saying is a side throw. Not a sidearm pitch, but a side throw. Well, what are you trying to say? This is the, this is the definition, a parable. Two ideas are thrown side by side for comparison to teach you and I something about kingdom principles. The kingdom of God is like the kingdom of heaven is like and then we're told what it's like. And then in there, there's a spiritual truth that can help you and I be guided along the way to understand kingdom truth, kingdom principles that can help you and I to live our lives 
if we so desire. You know, you got to have a desire to even want to live for the king. Yeah. Now, the only way that the desire to live for the king can ever enter into you is that hopefully somebody called by the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. I don't know what your story is, but my story is, is that my older sister showed up at our house when I was 13. And she was talking about Jesus so much that I didn't even know what to do with it. And from there, though, I'm not going to get into the long version of the story. From there, something happened to me after I had been rebelling against God for many a year. I finally ended up on my knees at an altar in Berwick, Louisiana, cried out to the name of Jesus. He came in and he transformed my life. But I got to tell you something. I fought against it. I had a rebellious spirit. I was like, I was more worried about everything but Jesus. I was worried about what the world thought was cool. I was worried about what that little girl over there thought about me. I was worried about what this over here thought about me. I was worried that all the dudes would think, I don't know what I was worried about, but I wasn't worried about Jesus. But I'll tell you one thing, the night that I got concerned about Jesus and I let him in, he changed everything. And I'm convinced that it's real. And the more I serve him, the more convinced I get that it's real. And the more i convinced I get that it's real, the less I'm worried about what everybody else thinks. And the less I, I don't really care if they think I'm crazy. Now that I'm a nurse practitioner working in the hospital and I get opportunities to tell people about the goodness of God, I know they think I'm crazy. But at the same time, I see people's lives. Their lives are in shambles. People, and they think that just because they drive new cars that they're okay, but you can tell. They're all bound up on the inside. The doctors ain't got no answers. The nurses ain't got no answers. Their lives are miserable. And they're looking for something else. And they're trying to fill it up with something else. But everything that they try to stuff in there. Just comes taking them empty. They're not finding what their spirit and their soul is yearning. I'm here to tell you. It's real simple. We can close the book. We can go home. His name is Jesus. And if you will simply yield your life to Right. I'm telling you right now. And it, it can be at the altar. It can be at your home. That's right. At the foot of your bed. But if you will sincerely call on Jesus and say, Lord, I need you. Yes. If you'll do that, if you'll open your heart, he'll change you. Yes. And he'll give you hope. Listen to me, friend. We're about to get into this parable. And this stuff is real. This isn't some fairy tale, my friend. This is the truth of the God, the word of God. And it's going to come to pass. Yes. And there's going to be a day when there ain't going to be no more talking. I'm going to show you. It's in the right. word. There ain't going to be no more talking, my friend. Oh, preacher, here you go. I can feel you. No, 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 no. I'm going to preach what's written. That's right. The Lord found me in a ballroom after 12 years of mediocre Christianity. And he spoke to me. And he said this. He said, you will lay your life down before me. And you will present my word for the way it's written. And then I will use you. Quit mucking around with my word, boy. Quit trying to present it in such a way that you're going to keep everybody happy. And they're going to be happy. And you're going to tickle their ears. And you're going to bring pleasant words. And oh, they're going to show up again next week. You don't worry about them. I'll take care of them. You do what I'm calling you to do. So that's what we're going to do. Parable. Two ideas. Now listen, I wrote this. I don't normally read this much. But I want to read it because I think it might have come out better the way I wrote it than if I just tried to say it. All right? So this is talking about parables. I'm trying to explain to you about parables. You ready? There are several kingdom of God parables in the book of Matthew. The word parable, we just talked about it. It's a Greek word. It's a compound word. Two parts. It means a side throw. It means to put two concepts together, right? The kingdom of God is God's heavenly kingdom and is also referenced, referenced in the word as the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, the words kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven are used interchangeably. The kingdom of God is like dot, dot, dot. Each parable contains a hidden measure of truth regarding a specific aspect of God's kingdom. These comparisons help our physical minds perceive spiritual truths. The world we live in is temporary. The life we live now is an interview for an eternal position. The temporary kingdoms built on earth by temporary physical lives will one day be abolished. And all the industrious efforts of the work that was employed in the physical realm will be judged. That's called the judgment seat of Christ. The work for eternal purpose will last and be rewarded. Whereas the work for self gain and pleasure will incinerate and evaporate into a vanished wisdom. It takes time for these thoughts to permeate into our spirit. 
that deep place where we are one with God. Can I just stop for a second and ask you, have you been born again? Yeah. Yeah. I got to ask that question. And listen, I'm not asking you to raise. No, preacher, I don't even know what you're talking about. You don't have to raise your hand and ask the question because I'm about to tell you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe it in him would not perish but have eternal life. Hallelujah. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him he might have life. God so loved you, my friend, that he sent Jesus, the most prized possession that heaven ever held, and he released him upon this wicked earth that was already fallen because of the disobedience of Adam and Eve. Oh, that's not my fault. It doesn't matter. You already put your hand in the pot, my friend. You were born of Adam, and now you must be born again. Yes. Supernatural, spiritual rebirth. It may not make sense to the natural mind, but the Word of God says, Jesus said, unless a man is born again, he will not see the kingdom of God, and he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So I implore you, whether you do it right now in your heart, whether you do it tonight on the side of your bed, I implore you to invite Jesus into your heart. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10 that he that would believe with his heart, not just your mind, my friend. If you're going to believe with your heart, you're going to have to start with your mind. You're going to have to believe that there truly was a man named Jesus 2,000 years ago that died on two pieces of wood outside a city called Jerusalem. You will have to believe it with your mind, but until you believe it with your heart. And confess it with your mouth. You are not saved. You are not born again. And until you get born again, that means that the Holy Spirit does not live on the inside of you. And if you die in that condition, there will be casting out into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus preached on hell, my friend. No, nobody wants to preach on hell anymore. Jesus says that the fire will not be quenched and the worm does not die. It is a literal place of physical torment. It is a place of darkness and separation from the presence of God. You do not want to be there, my friend. That's right. That's right. And the only way to stop it is to call upon that name. That's, right. That's all you got to do. That's all you got to do is whisper the name and need it. If you just whisper the name, man, it doesn't have to be some specialized prayer that's memorized. It has to be a place in the heart where you come to the realization, I've been living life on my own and it's not working and everything's empty. But if you're anything like me, you'll just probably keep on traveling in your own direction like my daddy used to tell me. Boy, you just like your old man. And you're going to have to go to the school of hard knocks. Son. Anyway. Don't go to the school of hard knocks. Just receive him. Yeah. Oh, yes, just receive him. Yes, yes. Let's not rebel against the church. All right. It takes time for these thoughts to permeate into our spirits, that deep place where we were one with God. That's why I went off on that rabbit trail. The Bible teaches that when you truly get saved, that your spirit, see, you got a spirit. But can I tell you something? If you ain't born again, your spirit is dead to God right now as we sit in this place. Yes. Right. Oh, but I think about God. No, 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 that's not what I'm talking about. I didn't ask you if you think about God. I said, if you were not born again, the Bible teaches that your spirit is dead to God. That's right. But if you get born again, yes. now he renews your spirit. He places his spirit on the inside of you. First Corinthians chapter six, verse 17 says this. And the spirit of God and the spirit of the man and the regenerate believer becomes one. Yes. Unity of spirit. Now the Holy Spirit lives in you. And if we, we will yield to that, he will speak to us. So once you get born again, it takes time, though, for these truths to permeate into our own spirit, that deep place where we are one with God. Our soulless man, that means Matt's mind, will, and his own emotions. Our soulless man is a close neighbor to our renewed spirit that has become one with God. The soul is also a close neighbor to these members. Our hands, our eyes, our ears, our feet, right? You know, you know what I'm talking about. That engage the physical realm. And here in this physical world, our life breathes, it feels, it lives its temporary life. Self is connected to this temporary physical realm as long as he remains, as long as self. I use a masculine pronoun. We can use he, she. It, it doesn't matter. Come on, somebody. Help me out here. That's just how they used to write in the old days. Do we have to be so freaked out about the lies of genderism? I'm not living in that world. I'm living in the kingdom of God. I'm not going to sit here and be swayed by the lies on social media. Amen. I'm not going to live under a spirit of fear. It's wrong. It's a lie. Homosexuality is a lie. Transgenderism is a lie. 
Abortion is an abomination in the eyes of God. The good news is this. God loves homosexuals. Right. Do you understand that? Yes. God, he loves homosexuals more than he loves old Matt whenever he was hiding as a Christian looking at pornography. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Help me. Help me, somebody. Can we just be real here? Right. Jesus ain't, ain't nothing hidden from his eyes. Right. We ain't hiding nothing from the Lord. Right. He's all about love. Yes. You get the point. The soul is also a close neighbor to these members that engage this physical realm. And here in the physical, our self breathes. And as long as we remain in this earthly house, we have a connection to this physical realm. True believers love God, right? And all of you in this place, I think you love God at least, at least a little bit because you wouldn't be in here this morning if you didn't love God at least a little bit, right? True believers love God. However, there remains a danger of also loving self. I don't want to die to that area. I don't want to let that go. I like that thing. That wasn't the Holy Spirit that told me that. that oh, even when that preacher said that, I don't believe that. Okay, that's between you and the Lord. There remains a danger of also loving self. Self can battle against the Spirit of God within us and bring us towards an even greater danger. A love for the world or the things of the world. For we are told, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The love of the Father and the life of the believer. I love this right here. I might write a book one day. The love of the life of the Father in the life of the believer will produce the Jesus diet in the life of the child of God. The Jesus diet. I like that. It's not the Daniel fast, my friend. It's not the Daniel fast. It's the Jesus diet. Diet. So I heard somebody scream from the crowd, what is the Jesus diet preacher? <laughs> Jesus saith unto them, my need is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Yeah. That's the Jesus diet, my friend. Yeah. Not to be the best employee on the job, although if you read the word of God, that's exactly what he's going to tell you to do. To show up on time and to give everything to the boss because you got a bigger boss than the boss that you're going to work for. And he's your God in heaven and he looks down and your work ethic reflects your walk with God. That's right. Yes. Not just to be the best parent, although the Lord would say, hey, emulate me and I will pour myself into your children. So many things, so many titles that we carry around. But if we would just learn how to yield to him, he would bless the things that we do. Oh, yeah. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. Oh, but I'm a soulish realm. I'm so close to this physical world that I live in and it affects me. Don't, don't buy into the lie, my friend. Please don't let, this would be a good prayer right here. Lord, please don't let the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches get in the way of my eternal reward. God's goodness gives us the parables to enlighten the eyes of our understanding on this side of heaven. So we can more properly navigate the journey so we can make it to the destination and receive a lasting reward when we get there. Amen. Do you believe that this morning? Do you believe that there is an eternal reward that will await the believer when we breathe our last breath here and take our first breath there? All this stuff. You know, Apostle Paul said, I was born of the tribe of Benjamin. I was circumcised on the eighth day. He was on the fast track to be a scholar, a teacher of Israel. I'm telling you, man, you study the life of the Apostle Paul. You want to talk about degrees and accolades, and you want to talk about uh, power in the physical realm. And you know what he said? It's all dung. <laughs> what is dung? It's like a, I mean, it sounds weird when I talk like this, but I do it anyway. It's like a pile of poo-poo. <laughs> it's like a cow patty. No, really. I mean, think about it. I'm not trying to even be, well, I guess I'm being a little funny. You have all the skins on the wall, master's degree in this and that and all this stuff. It's a bunch of dumb. Oh, I can tell you, like, I'm so grateful for my testimony. I don't mean to go on a high school dropout sitting on an air conditioner waiting for somebody to come get me high. And then the Lord would save me and allow me to go get a GED and a nursing degree and then a master's in nursing and a master's in theology. All that good stuff. But let me just tell you something right now, my friend. If I hold on to that and I won't let God have his way in my life, then that testimony gets worn out. Now maybe it's time to recognize it for what it is. It's a beautiful thing. It's a great thing. It's been an awesome career. But hallelujah, if the Lord starts 
saying let it down has got to go because it ain't nothing but a pile of dung. Everything that will give glory to the Lord, let everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. But anything that gets in the way, let it die. Let it be buried. Oh, hallelujah. Yield it over to the Lord so that he can resurrect it in your life. That child that you keep praying for, we got to let him go. we got to let him go into the trusting hands of our Savior. That's right. Amen. That whatever that thing is that you've been dealing with, we got to be able to trust him. And it's not easy. It's not. And listen to me, Christian. You can't just come to church on Sunday. This, and none of this is in my notes, but this is what the Lord wants you to hear right now. You can't just come to church on Sunday or Wednesday. Then he, we got we to gotta go back to the old path. Yes. Jeremiah talked about the yes. old path. Yes. The church is sick, Christian. Ooh. If you've been watching church on television, I'm not saying there's no good churches on television. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying the bride is asleep like Peter in the yes. garden. I'm saying just as the Lord was about to go to the cross, the Lord's about to come back and the days are yes. dark. We've got to go back to the old ways. How they did it in the old days, people travailed in the presence of God. Yes. What is travail? <laughs> It's a warning and it's a crying out and you got to travail for your own personal life and I got to travail for my own personal life in the church. I gotta, we got to come together as intercessors. We've been praying. We've been having some great intercessors, man. Y'all know who y'all are. Y'all can't make it to everyone. Some of them make it in just 10, 15 minutes before service, right? Some of, some of y'all make it in on Tuesday. Some of y'all make it in on Friday. Some of y'all make it every time. Some of y'all can't make it. But the point is, is that you're making it. And when you hear hallelujah, you're crying out to the Lord. And I don't think you're just crying out for your own needs. I hope not. That's why I started praying a little bit out loud for about 15, 20 minutes each time to make sure we're all on the same page. Because what we're supposed to be crying out for is that we would become a soul harvesting combine. That Rachel's barren womb, we would cry out, oh, the barren womb cries out, Lord, give us children, give us souls, or else we die. Because the heartbeat of God is that people are falling headlong into a devil's hell and there they will be faced with eternal torment. And if we don't believe that, then we don't believe the word of God. And what are we doing? Just a quick fix for our little life? Help us, Lord. Help us not to be selfish. Because I believe that if I would trust you and I will serve you, you're going to take care of the rest, Lord. You're going to take care of the rest. And I know that there's people in this place that you've been through heartache and you've been through situations and circumstances, but yet you've seen God take care of you. Yes. You have watched God take care of you. And each and every one of you, along with myself, we can admit along the way, even though he took care of us, we could have given more. Could we not have given more? Uh, can we not still give more to him? I'm talking about the king and kingdom. I'm not talking to, I'm not talking about just a specific church. I'm talking about the king and kingdom. The king. To the king alone, I will give my life. To the king alone, hallelujah. Day and night. To the king, I will sing, hallelujah. I want to give him my life, church. Praise you, Jesus. So he gives us these parables so that we can make it to the destination, so that we can receive that lasting reward. Eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. All right? The parables like goats and sheep and tares and wheat and the separation of fish remind us that narrow is the way and few there will be that journey the path towards eternal life. Parables of the treasure and the pearl direct the work of our lives only when we slow down enough to ponder that the king is saying, will we perceive the value of eternal life in his words? We cannot perceive them till we slow down and we ponder. A merchant sells the seas in a quest for the best of pearls. He's driven. He crosses every ocean. He scours every cove for goodly pearls. And then one day he finds the pearl and realizes that every other pearl he ever saw, ever handled, ever thought was beautiful was meaningless in comparison. Now that he found this pearl, oh, how he wishes he would have found this pearl sooner. 
He could have saved so much time. He could have worked so much more efficiently. He could have presented so much less stress in his life. But what's important now is that he found the pearl. Yeah, amen. It's a treasure hidden in a field. And it's so brilliant, valuable, precious, and real. He begins a going out of business sale. Everything must go. All else must take a back seat to this pearl, to this treasure that he found. His family will think he's lost his mind. Father, mother, brother, sister, even spouses may say he's gone too far. But if they get in the way of this endeavor, it is they who must go. Not the pearl. Not the tra oh, preacher, you said I can leave my husband. Come on, somebody. I didn't say that. You don't know me now. But what I am trying to tell you is this. If they get in the way, he who doesn't hate father or mother, brother or sister yeah. cannot have me. You think Jesus wants anybody to hate anybody? He who hung naked on the cross to pay the penalty for sin. Jesus don't want nobody hated. Jesus is saying if they get in the way of what you're going to come to me, because if you're going to follow after me, you're going to have to deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow after me. He who seeks to save his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will, re will gain eternal life. Not just an eternal reward, but guess what? You're going to get a reward right here today. It's coming. Can you believe it? Hallelujah. So there he is. He, he, he says uh, the, the spouse is going to say he's gone too far. They, they, they're the ones that are going to have to go. Not the pearl. The pearl's not going nowhere. No, 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 no. Not the treasure. He will cling to the pearl and the treasure like it is his next breath and his next heartbeat, heartbeat that will oxygenate his cells in his life, in his reality. Everything else was a mirage. How could have he been so blind for so long? How could have he wasted so much time? But what is important is that he finally found it and now nothing else. I said nothing else will do. Nothing else. Right. Not a new man that was good looking and he spent time in the gym and he made waffles for you before he went to the gym. And he wants to hold your hand and whisper sweet nothings in your ear. And he's just sweet as pie and he's just as good looking as whoever's good looking now. That, no, that man ain't going to do it for you, my friend. It's a lie. It's a mirage. Not the best job, not the best promotion, not a AMG Mercedes, not a 5,000 square foot house with crown molding and marble floors. Ain't none of that going to get it done, my friend. You got a hole in your heart, and the only thing that's going to unlock the key is Jesus. And until you put him in there, and until you let him have his life. Come on, church. I'm telling you the truth. I know you know it. You can feel it. <laughs> now when you walk out of here, don't let the devil lie to you. <laughs> Come on. So he immerses himself in this new industry he has found. He partners with a landowner. See, these are all parables. You got to be able to catch it. He partners with a landowner who is also the son of a mighty king. He's offered an opportunity to put his hands to the plow. Put a hammer to a nail, engage in an investment opportunity, and join in this endeavor. Graciously, he is given a certain value, parable of the talents, by the landowner with which to start his investment plan. And the landowner goes away on a long journey, but one day he's going to return. Yes. Yes. He's going to return and he's going to assess the work that was done. His work will be inspected. It will be scrutinized. Every angle Cut and measurement will be evaluated. And that which was handled with great care and excellence for the right purpose, with pure motive of what was best for king and kingdom, will be gloriously rewarded. Whereas all else will vanish like a flitted wisp of an extinguished candle. That portion of the work will be consumed by the fire of God there will be no residual or evidence that it ever existed. It will not make it into the next life. And the parable of the wedding feast is the invitation. 
the opportunity to be able to participate in the joy of the king. The landowner has returned. The goats and sheep, tares and wheat, the fish in the net, it's all been separated. The work has been assessed. The rewards are ready and they will be distributed at the banquet. Won't you come and partake of this most joyous occasion of the king? Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. You are invited to the most glorious banquet ever experienced by the human creation. Join the festivities. No, really, you do not want to miss this event. P.S. RSV. Respond, s'il vous plaît, by faith. Oh, one more last thing. Proper attire is required. You ready? Here we go. So let's start there. Let's start there. Matthew 22, 12. Let's start at the end. And he says unto him, friend, how camest thou in hither? not having a wedding garment on, and he was speechless. See, these are the kinds of things that hit me when I'm studying for a passage, when I'm studying to preach a message. I say, Lord, if my personality is in the way, if I'm too hard, soften me up. I don't want to be hard all the time, Lord. And then I come across something and I'll pop on it. And look, here's the word speechless. Speechless to muzzle the mouth. <laughs> That's what the word means. Speechless. To muzzle them out. How can you get any more direct than that? The point is, is that one day all the talk is over, my friend. The Lord, you know, my daddy used to tell me. Back, you know, ex-Marine, all that kind of stuff. He said, let me tell you something, boy. Talk is cheap. One day, the talk is over. The opportunity to talk to the king was on this side. One day, there ain't no more talk. It's done. Can you imagine, you know, I was thinking about this. See, there was a time on earth where the Lord even spoke through Isaiah. He'd been trying to talk. The Lord's been trying to talk, my friend. He'd been trying to talk to you. He'd been trying to talk to me, right? He says, won't you come? Let us reason together. Though your sins be like scarlet, they can be made white as snow, white as wool, white, white, white. I've been wanting to sit down and talk. Have you ever been in a situation or a... An occurrence where you're sitting there, like I know I have because I love words, and boy, I've gotten myself in trouble with words, and Lord, <laughs> forgive me. I love to win, or used to love, to win a debate. Yes. And boy, look, the Lord, thank you, Jesus. He's blessed me with some, some things, but guess what? I've used sometimes, I've used it for the wrong purpose. But there's been a couple of times I got into a little wrangle with words with people that were a little bit more adept than I was. And then every now and then it's like, boom, they hit me with something and they go, <laughs> 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 embarrassed face emoji. I ain't got nothing to say. I'm speechless. <laughs> so when you think about this right here in this situation, speechless to close the mouth with the muzzle time, talk time is over. And you know, you ever seen those stories? There was that little story of that kid that said, I saw heaven. And then he started talking about all these people. And, and he, you can tell that he wasn't even really a true believer. I'm just saying. Like, I'm not trying to call the dude out. I don't even know the name of the book. It was many, many years ago. But you hear these stories. I died and I went to the light. Y'all remember that? And it seemed like everybody saw the light. Y'all ever thought about that before? Oh, so I guess everybody goes to heaven. And I'm thinking the whole time for all these years, I'm thinking, mm, I ain't thinking so, my friend. I know what the word of God said. There's some kind of deception in that light. And you better, you better start looking a little bit more closely at the true light because there's something going on with that. I'm not trying to tell you that what I'm about to tell you is definitely true because it's the testimonials of other people. Anytime I get my testimony or look, you got to figure out whether somebody's a valid witness or not. But Wade gave me a couple videos, a couple girl, a girl from work a while back gave me a video of people that say that they died and that they went, they went to hell. But when they first breathed their last breath, what happened was they were rushing towards a light. Their spirit was in a darkened tunnel, but they could see light at the end of the tunnel. And they're just moving at the sound of, the sound of light, speed, speed of light, whatever. And they're moving towards the light. And I can only imagine, can you imagine your spirit is like, whoo, look at the light. And it's like every second, I'm, I'm going, I'm getting ready to be into the glory of the Lord. And then the next thing you know, you show up only to find out this. Two of these guys said the same thing. They said, I was rejected when I got there. You get to the light, and then you face the judge, and he says, I never knew you. Cast him out into outer darkness. 
Talk time is over, my friend. And it said they were plunged head wound into a deep pit. And it seemed like they fell forever. And the further they fell, the darker it got. And then they just landed with this thud. What is my point? My point is this, is that there's coming a day when talk time is over. The time to talk to the Lord is now. Don't let another second go by. Don't let another minute go by, amen, without talking to your kid. And just tell him that you love him. And tell him that you want him to work in your life, amen. You're not going to wake up tomorrow acting like me. It's going to be okay because he's going to work in you the way he wants to work in you. And he's going to develop you the way he wants to develop you. You don't have to freak out think, oh, I'm going to start acting like Pastor Matt tomorrow. No, hallelujah. But if he's talking to, hallelujah. Amen. All right. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And you know, I was thinking about this too, and I'm not trying to pick, listen, if you got this tattoo in here and you're hiding it, or if you're watching on video, I'm not trying to pick about people's tattoos. I got my own opinion about tattoos. I'm not going to preach on tattoos this morning. All right. I got a tattoo, but I still got an opinion about tattoos that I didn't used to have. And I'm not going to get into it. I'm still going to restrain myself. But there's this one tattoo that irritates me so bad. Only God can judge me. And it's not even that I don't know each person's motive on why they put the tattoo on their body. So I'm not trying to call them out. I'm really not. I'm trying to say there's a spirit behind this concept. There's a spirit behind it. And what I say to that spirit is you're a lying, vile spirit. That's right. And you're lying to people, yeah. to eternal souls. Amen. And, the, and the spirit of truth would say, you better believe it. Only God can judge you and God will judge you. That's right. And he's going to judge with the righteous judge. It doesn't mean just because you have that tattoo on your body that you're going to be judged the wrong way. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say there's a spirit in the earth, on the world, yeah. that's yeah. saying only God can judge me. Yeah. I'm here to tell you that the word of the Lord. Is going to judge you. I'm here to tell you that the spirit of truth is going to judge people. Amen. And what we want to do is we want to allow our judgment to have already been placed on the eternal Lamb of God. Yes. Right. He took our judgment. Right. And if we will yield ourselves to the will of God, to the truth of God's word, we won't have to worry about the great white throne judgment. I'm about to preach on that too. The difference between the great white throne judgment and yes. the judgment seat of Christ. Yeah. The big difference. Yep. We don't have to work. But listen, I just want to share whoever might be watching out there in video. If you got that, just if you got the tattoo, it is what it is. But if that's your spirit, if that's the spirit behind your heart, then you're like, you can't. Like, you, know, you know what that spirit says? Don't you dare tell me that I'm doing something wrong. Right. That's what that spirit's saying. Right. Oh, yeah. oh, I'm not telling you you're doing something wrong. I'm telling you what the word of God says. Yeah. I'm telling myself what the word of God says. Right. That's right. I got to remind Pastor Matt. Whenever the wrong opportunity arises. No, God will judge you, my friend. Right. Yes. I don't want to lose my walk with the Lord. I love him. Let me keep going. So what is this wedding garment? It's not made by Armani, Perry Ellis, or Calvin Klein. It's the apparel that the father has been weaving since he found Adam and Eve naked in the garden. And hiding within the trees. It's the skin of an innocent animal, skins representing a sinless sacrifice that would be fulfilled in his sinless son. His name is Jesus. Galatians 3.27 says this in the King James Version. It says, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ Jesus have put on Christ. You know, out of all the scriptures in the Bible, because I don't even really like the NIV that much. I use it sometimes to compare. It's a long story on why. But overall, I don't really like the NIV translation. But in this particular verse, I always love the way the NIV said it. But this is the beauty of this. I found out the NASB says it the same way. And that's a literal translation. So this is what it says. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. You put him on. Yes. He becomes the wedding garment. He becomes the fulfillment. He becomes the linen, the white linen that the saints are clothed with. Yeah. He becomes the garment. He's yeah. the ticket into the invitation. He's the invite. He's the way gets you into the banquet. Yeah. If you got the wedding garment on, how 
Hallelujah. It means that the Lord is letting you know outside of Christ because of sin, man is found naked. This is what it says in Revelation 3 verse 18 when the Lord speaking to the church of Laodicea. I counsel you to buy me gold tried in the fire that you might be rich and white raiment. What does that mean? White clothing. What is white? Purity. Holiness. What is clothing? That you would clothe yourself. I ask you to buy white raiment. Why? That you might be clothed and that the shame of your nakedness does not appear. The Lord's providing the proper attire. The Father's been weaving the clothing that's needed for the banquet. And the question is, I'm starting to put in there, did you make your appointment on the books of the tailor? But we're not getting into that. What we need to do is we need to give our heart to Jesus. Amen. And we need to allow him to have his way. Amen. So that was the, that was the first thing. You got to have on the right attire. Secondly, I just wanted to put, say this. The problem is that we can't just get in any way we want to. That's what everybody in the world wants. Oh, no, there's many spokes that lead to the center of the wheel. YOLO, you only live once. You do you. Do it your way. You can't judge me. No, there's only one way. You know, I've been talking to many, many Muslims. I have. Because you know what? I want to share the love of Jesus with everybody. Yeah. And I ain't scared. Dude, there's a spirit of fear. Yeah. Just with a poor little lady with a burqa on. I'm going to say it. Take me off YouTube. I don't care. <laughs> a poor little lady with a burqa on. And it's like, back in the day, back when 9-11 first happened, I was working in clinics and I'd see people come in. I'm like, oh, wow, man. They might have something up under their clothes, you know? <laughs> no, no, you know, y'all ain't, y'all ain't like I'm crazy. <laughs> I know y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but as a lie, it's a spirit of fear. <laughs> What's the worst they can do is kill me? And then I'm on dancing on the streets of gold and I believe that. But whenever I have opportunities to talk to these people and, 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 to, and to minister to them, and they're like, oh no, we believe Jesus was a great prophet. I'm like, but you can't. What are you talking about? Well, you can't believe he's a great prophet because you don't believe he's the son of God. There you go. And, and, and you don't believe that God even had a son. And you don't believe it's the same Jesus that died on the cross. Well, what you don't know, you know what I'm talking about. Because if you don't, then you hadn't read your book. You hadn't studied. Yeah. But, 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 but so you can't say that Jesus is a good prophet because really and truly, because of what you believe, Jesus is a liar. Come on. Because Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Yeah, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. You can't have it both ways. He can't be a good prophet and a liar at the same time. See, so somebody's wrong. Yeah. Somebody's wrong. Somebody's believing a lie. Lord, help us. Amen. And this is what Jesus said in John chapter 10. I am the door of the sheep. He said in verse 9, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved. But I didn't know screams a voice out of the throes of hell. I didn't know. I just didn't know, preacher. That's not true. It's not true, ma'am. It's not true, sir. You didn't know. You knew. But you didn't care. I know you knew because the spirit has been calling since the beginning. Six times in this story, the word call or bidden was used. Six times. Each time it's the same Greek word, kaleo. It's where we get our word call. The spirit is calling. Wisdom has been calling. We read about it last week in Proverbs 8. But if you remember wisdom, y'all remember that? Wisdom is personified. You're like a woman and she's walking in the streets. And she's standing at the entrance of the gates. And she's standing at the marketplace. And she's up on the high place. And she's saying, come unto here. Here. Come, won't you come, oh you simple. Won't you come in here? The things that I speak are things that are right. They are pure. They are righteousness. Oh, there's nothing perverse in me. There's nothing forward in me. Nothing perverse. Won't you come and let me speak? Won't you let me reason with you? Spirit of wisdom has been crying from the beginning. The spirit of the Lord. Spirit of the bride says, come. Let he who is thirsty come. Let him come and drink of the waters of the the living waters freely. Yes. The Spirit of God been calling. That's right. People been rejecting. Mm -hmm. People been rejecting, and when they reject, it cuts them off. That's right. It's not to say he's not going to come back. It's not to say he won't come back from an, with another person, give him another opportunity, water a seed that's already been planted. It's not to say that. But this—that's the problem. It's not that you didn't know, and I could get into that even much deeper, but. We don't really have time. No, God is going to be justified when he judges. Yeah. 
He is going to be justified when he judges. Amen? In verse 3 of the parable, the king sent his servants. He's been sending his servants. He sent wisdom. Uh, you can tell out of the way I described it that there's concern in her voice. She's pleading with people. He sent wisdom. He sent Enoch. He sent Noah, Abraham, Moses, Elijah, Elisha, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Nehemiah. He sent John the Baptist. He sent Jesus, man. <laughs> he sent Peter, James, and John. He sent Luke. You get the point. He's sending me. He sent Paul, Silas, Barnabas. He's sending you. He sent all of them. <clears throat> He's sending people all over the world. The problem isn't that no one knew. The problem is they didn't care. That's what it said in the verse. Look, verse 5, Matthew 22, 5. But they made light of it. And they went their own ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. They made light of it. Help us, Lord. Okay, it's not really that I didn't know. It's not exactly that I didn't care. I'm, I'm softening it up. <laughs> I want to be soft or something. I do. I don't want to be hard, man. But if I'm really honest, I'm just talking for the other person right now. If I'm really honest, I was just, I was just really, really busy. And compared to what I had to get done, I, I, I mean, come on, man. I mean, cut me some slack. I mean, little Jimmy had baseball. The Billy had jujitsu. Sally had dance and soccer. I mean, both Tommy and I, we both worked. It was really busy. It was really busy. It's not that I didn't care. I did. I just, I realize now I'm eating light. See, whenever you was in it, you didn't realize you was being alive. Because everything else was just so busy. Right. Everything else was just so important. Man, you preaching a hard message. I'm preaching you the word of God, my friend. Right? My desire is to help you with the word of God. Because you know what the Lord showed me recently? And I've shared this with y'all, but I'm going to share it again. It's one thing if somebody in your church gets an opinion wrong. You know, I'm talking about the kind of opinion you still make it to heaven, but you lost some reward, man. There's one thing if people in your church get an opinion wrong for themselves, and it's one thing if you get an opinion wrong for yourself, but boy, ain't that a mess if you had an opinion wrong and it affected your whole congregation. Right. Yeah. yeah, right there, maybe you want to get on my face. Yeah. Oh, I've been knowing it, but no, when it hits you, when it hits you like that, all the wasted time. Come on, somebody. Well, come on, preacher. You're saying I don't get up and go to work? Of course not. I can give you a myriad of scriptures that talk about he that doesn't work is worse than an infidel. He that doesn't work doesn't eat. I can give you a myriad of scriptures that tells you to be the best employee on the job. I can give you a myriad of scriptures that tell you that you work for a boss that's bigger than the boss that you see with your own eyes. I can give you a myriad. I can give you scriptures that says, boss, you need to understand that you treat your people right because you got a boss ahead of you. I can give you scripture after scripture. That's not the point. I'm trying to say everything needs to be folded within the truth of the kingdom of God and making it to the banquet. I'm trying to say that when you yield your life to the Holy Spirit, He'll make you the best boss. He'll make you the best employee. He'll make you the best mama, daddy, child. He'll make you the best nurse practitioner. He'll make you the best whatever He desires for you to be. Yes. Yeah. As we yield to the Spirit of God. Yes. He'll speak to you. He might tell you to quit your job. I don't know what he's going to tell you, but if he does, he's going to give you the grace right. and the sustenance right. and the provision right. if the Holy Spirit tells you. Right. Right. Don't let no man be telling you what you're supposed to do. Now, sometimes God uses a man and a woman as a prophetic mouthpiece. And you'll know. You might not like it at first. Okay, wait, we can go on. Let's not do that. All right. They made light of it. Look, the same verse, though. I changed it. But look, now I highlighted merchandise. I want to spend a little bit of time on that. Let me close. You ready? In this word merchandise, this is so interesting to me. And let me tell you why. This is the kind of thing that kind of gets me going. This is the kind of thing that gets my little, my, my uh, you know, my, my, I don't want to say the wrong way. It gets me fired up. It gets me fired up. The word of God. When I see little things like this connection boom, 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 throughout the word, yeah. the big picture, yeah. 
See, I can tell you about, uh, you know, the, the parable of the sower. With the thorn, right? That the thorns that grow up alongside of the seed, and it says they wrap it around. It's like a, it's like a, they wrap around, they put, put a chokehold on them. The seed of the God, the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word of God. Yeah, that's right. The busyness of life choke it. But whenever you start to see even a bigger finding in other places of the Bible that you didn't realize to find it at the other layers. You know what? I'm thinking I'm going to write a book one time. No, really. I'm going to start writing some books. I believe it. I believe it with all my heart. When I got more time, I'm going to write. I don't know if anybody's going to buy them, but I'm going to write them. I believe it. <laughs> I'm starting to see something in the scripture. I've been seeing it for a while. It's like an excavation, my friend. You want to go for a treasure hunt? You start digging into the word of God. Oh, my goodness. There's another layer down here. There's another layer of meaning that just like, what? It's, the Bible all by itself is prophetic. You want more pro prophetic ministry in your life? Start digging in the Word of God, man. The Word of God becomes prophetic in all of itself. There's a literal meaning on the surface, and yeah. you start digging a little bit. And then as soon as you think you found the treasure, whoa, the mother loads a couple layers underneath that. All right, I made a point. Merchandise. Let's look at this word. This word... It's kind of hard to read this maybe, but I looked it up in the Greek and the word is emporium. So I looked up in an English dictionary, the word emporium. Have y'all ever heard of drug emporium in Lafayette? My father-in-law used to love that store. He'd go over there and I mean, they, cause they had different kinds of stuff, but an emporium. When I saw that word in the Greek, that's the kind of thing that catches my attention, my attention. And I looked up the word emporium. It's got, I put the two different uh, definitions in red. You ready? First, it's a large retail store, but this is the one I want you to see. Look at this. A place, a town or city of important commerce, especially a principal center of trade. And this is an example. New York is one of the world's great emporiums. Do you get it? So, so what, what this is why I want to help you try to help focus your attention. And then whenever I'm done, you can say whether or not you agree with what I was saying. I want to help focus your attention on the concept of a biblical city. And I want you to understand in the grand scheme of the entirety of God's word that there's been two cities that are being built. One city started in Babel. Or under the leadership of Nimrod, an evil man, he said, come, let us make bricks. Let us build ourselves a tower that reaches into the heavens. Let us build a name for ourselves. Let us make a city. And they try to build their city with the work of man's hands and they try to reach heaven. And then in the end of the book, there's a city that's currently under construction. Jesus said to his disciples in John chapter 14, he said, I go away to my father's house. In my father's house, there are many men. He's going, he's building something. He said, and if I go away, I'm coming back to you. And if it was not so, I wouldn't I tell you. And we see in the book of Revelation, a city that's being built in heaven and it comes down. To God. So man's building a city. Man's building a kingdom. And guess what? He ain't building it by himself, buddy. He's building it. Whether he realizes it or not, with the help of a liar, the help of a deceiver that's trying to pull the masses away from the truth of God. Yeah. You're building a city down here, man. And I'm going to try to show it to you a little bit more, but I wanted you to understand that. So, look, this is this is a powerful thing. Look, you're going to have to go back and do this study for yourself because I'm just hitting a very, very superficial part of this. In Ezekiel 27, if you look at Ezekiel 27, I'm only giving you two verses, but if you go home at some point, if you care, and you read Ezekiel 27 and 28, you will realize that there's two main spots in the Old Testament that reveal some aspects about our enemy to us. One of them comes in Ezekiel 28. The other one comes in Isaiah 14. The way that the wording of the enemy comes is that it starts off with a human leader. Because you do understand that the enemy has been working through human leaders. But in both of those cases, in, in, in Ezekiel, is the prince of Tyre. There's a lot that I could talk to you about like that that I love, but we don't have time. And in Isaiah, it's the king of Babylon. Okay, And in both cases, you're told about a human being. 
But if you read enough, all of a sudden the story transitions and he starts to show you the behind the scenes. He starts to show you the power that was actually behind the man. And the power behind the man, it becomes real clear, he was a supernatural power. In Ezekiel, it was the, it was, it, his name was Lucifer before he fell. His name is Satan. He's the adversary of God. He's the enemy of God. He's trying to pull God's people away. He's trying to pull all humanity away. He's trying to destroy people's souls. And he does it the way that he does it. I'm about to reveal some things to you that's going to help you to be able to see something, I hope, in a little bit of a different light. Okay. And so in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, but look, it's starting off right here because this is a symptom of the liar. And this is talking about the prince of Tyre. And this is what Ezekiel says. The word of the Lord came, up, came again unto me saying, now, son of man, he's talking to Ezekiel, take up a lamentation. A word of sorrow for Tyrus. And say unto Tyrus, O you that are situate at the entry of the sea, you are a merchant. Merchant. Merchandise. I'm not making this up. This is the same thought. I'm telling you right now, it's the same thought. You're going to see what I'm talking about. Of the people for many isles. Thus says the Lord God, O Tyrus, you have said, I am. Am of perfect beauty. Now, I want you to tell you, some people are into economics more than others. Some people probably watch Fox News. Some people probably play this, maybe mess around with the stock market. Some people might understand a little bit more about finances and world movements and operations and various things like that. But when you talk about merchant and you talk about aisles, and if you read chapter 28 of Ezekiel, you're going to see, it talks about his ships and his navy. And it talks about the 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 bringing of goods to here and to there and the wealth that's produced from all of that. Now, I want you to see how making your connection to that, to the book of Revelation chapter 18. I want you to understand something. When we talk about the beast, we're not just talking about a human being. There's going to be a human being that will be possessed by the works of Satan. He is the Antichrist. He is the beast. He will bring deception. But listen, his system is already here. Right? The beast system is already here. The beast system of religion has been here from the get at in the garden. And the, be and the system of, of governments that have been against God has been here from the get. Okay. And guess what? The financial system has been here for a long time. They slowly been cooking us like a frog in a pot. And I'm here to tell you right now and that if the Lord doesn't pour out his spirit, they going no, no, even though the Lord's gonna pour out his spirit, there's gonna be a whole lot of people that are gonna get caught up in the mess. Now in Revelation, now I want you to know, oh, the prince of Tyre, the merchant, the merchandise. And look, Revelation 18, 2. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, fallen. Babylon. Look at this. Saying, Alas, alas, great city. See there, city. Great city, Babylon, that mighty city. For in one hour is your judgment come. It's coming. Yeah. But I want you to understand something. It's not Babylon, the city. You may not agree with me on this, and that's fine. And listen, I'm going to hear to tell you that it's possible that modern-day Iraq, which is the old Babylon, yeah, the dinar might revalue. You may not even know what I'm talking about. That's not important right now. The dinar might revalue, and some people might have some big old fat pockets, and I hope it does because I got a little bit tucked away too. But guess what? Let me tell you a little secret. That ain't what it's all about. Hallelujah. And if it does revalue, then that's just another part that is part of of the situation. That's part of the B system. And you might have some prosperity for a little bit of time, but let me tell you what the word of the Lord said. The word of the Lord says that the beast is coming, my friend. The word, uh, but hey, and before Jesus comes, he's coming. Oh, you give too much glory. I ain't giving no glory to that liar. I'm trying to prepare you to understand so that you can prepare your own heart to understand. Somebody will come riding on a white horse, and the first one, you don't want to tie hands with him. All right, we ain't getting in all the timing of this, that, and the other thing. I'm trying to make a point to you. The enemy is here, and he's bringing deception. Yes, yes. Yes. It's not just the city of Babylon. Look, you see that little vapor back there? I got a point to that, so just hold on. It's China's silk back in the old days. Chinese silk merchandise. You ever heard of that? The Silk Road? But now it's China's manufacturing. It's India's spice trade back in the gap. 
It's Mozambique's graphite. What you talking about? Oh, they're mining graphite in Mozambique. They ship it over here to Vidalia. They're going to make spherical hand node. Why? So that it can fuel a Tesla battery so Doc can drive his car. It's African gold. It's New York's Wall Street. Yeah. It's German engineering. You understand? It's the merchants. And I don't even know that I put the scripture in here. But listen, it says it in Revelation 18. It talks about for all nations. In Revelation 18, 3. All nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. Look at this. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. Listen to me. I'm not, I, you, you got to make your own decision. There's coming a day yep. when we're going to realize we don't even got caught up in some mess. Mm. The whole system that we're living, this is not accidental. Oh, that's right. You understand that? You can think the Republicans are your friends all day long. But I'm here to tell you right now. Yeah. Yeah, do, 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 do I believe in smaller government and let the people? Yes, I believe in that. But I'm trying to make a point. Dude, this stuff has been being baked. This is a slow cooker. They all involved. You can't trust them. And you might press the button in the voting booth, and I will. I'm going to pick the one. And, if he, and you know what? And if he says he... <laughs> I got to keep my flesh out of it. <laughs> but if he says he's going to put a tariff on China, that's probably the one I'm going to press the button for. Right. But do I believe that he's always going to do that day? No, I'm sleeping with one eye open, my friend. <laughs> you ain't gonna catch, by the grace of God, you ain't going to catch me. This is the point I'm trying to make. You see that little smoke coming up there? Because he has got a spirit connected to it. Because it made the merchants of the earth rich. But that little vapor right there, that's like some, that's a spirit behind that. That thing that makes you walk by that neurologist Mercedes AMG and be like, wow, dude, that is a nice car. And then the next thing you know, you're trying to buy a car like that on a nurse practitioner's salary. You're not a neurologist, dude. <laughs> what are you doing? You can do it. You get caught up. We all get caught up. The Lord wants to bless us, but whenever he brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, the prosperity that he placed upon them by the Egyptians was not for their own pleasures. It was for his purposes. That's, right. That's why I keep on talking about this truth, is that, <laughs> is that we partner together we find a place that we believe that we can serve the Lord together, right. whether it's this house or another house. And what we determine is whether or not the truth is being preached, yeah. not whether or not we like the message, but whether or not the message is true. Right. And whether or not the truth going forth is going to help us to bring the message outside the walls of this church, yeah. that we would extend kingdom for the king and that we would not build our own kingdom. And in order for that to happen, that means that we have to start dying to self. And that means, how do I do that? It means you do it in various ways. You pray, not just for yourself, but you pray for the church. I mean, I'm inviting people to come. I'm not trying to make you feel weird. I'm really not, but I got to communicate. We need more people to pray. We need more prayer. Because if we're going to believe God for a supernatural move of God, we need more people to pray. I'm not, I, I'm going to keep on praying. I'm going to keep on praying and asking God to keep sending the oil of his presence. And that in the midst of worship, that the spirit of God is going to move on people's hearts. And that the word of God is going to go forward with, with anointing, whether it's me preaching or somebody else. Because there's plenty of preachers that he's rising up inside the walls of this church. And I know a bunch of them that we, we're going to keep bringing them in. And, but that the anointed word of God will go forth. And that it will change us. And that then we will take that change outside and we will minister to others. And that we will extend the kingdom of God and that we will 
do the work of the ministry until the landowner comes back to assess the work. And we will give our time, our prayer, and even our finances because the word of God says so. But you will hear the voice of God for yourself. But I'm going to keep speaking what I see and communicate it to you. And you're not going to feel weird like he keeps talking about money every time before service because we're going to keep talking about money because it's in there. And you're not going to feel weird and think that he's a preacher that asks for money because it's not even true. Yeah, we're going to ask for money because we need money, but it's not the point. We're not a prosperity preaching church. Oh, we preach the prosperity in the kingdom. <coughs> but we're not over here focused on all of that. We want to do the work of the, of the ministry. And we're going to preach on holiness. And we're going to preach on being obedient to God's word. And we're going to preach that the reason we can be obedient to God's word is because God the Father already sent his son and his son died. And Jesus said it is finished. And he said that when he died, that he took power over authorities, principalities, powers, and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. So you and I can be obedient to the word of God because Jesus already died to give us not just salvation, but sanctification. Amen. That the spirit of God released into our life is more powerful than any demon spirit. It's more powerful than any sin out there. And it's more powerful than temptation. Right. But we got to be aware and we got to understand how to submit ourselves under the word of God, under the will of God. And as we do that, the Holy Spirit pours more. Yeah. He pours yeah. more. He gives more grace. Oh, come on, music ministry. This is enough. Enough preaching this morning. Come on, let's worship the Lord. Hallelujah. The more we yield, the more he releases. The more he releases, the more hungry we get. The more hungry we get, the more we cry out. Oh, come on. You, you see where I'm going? The more we cry out, the more he pours out. Amen. I don't know about you, but I want more. Amen. I want more of his presence.